We're going to hear a reading from Genesis, and since it's read by Brenda, it may not quite be what you expect. <laughs> Hello. Hello, right. Brenda. There we are. Right. This children's Bible is the one I used when I was here 30 years ago. It's still going strong. But um, Adam and Eve's story is a bit brutal in the real Bible. So it's still brutal. But I'll read you my version. Okie dokie. Hope you're sitting comfortably. Then I'll begin. Right. Now, Adam and Eve lived in the garden and were very happy. They were allowed to do anything they liked except one thing. God told them they were not allowed to eat the fruit from the tree in the middle of the garden. God wanted to see if the man and woman loved enough to do as he asked and obeyed him. Hmm. Now the serpent hated God. And he knew that God loved the man and woman, so he decided to try and hurt them and spoil God's word. So, putting on his smarmiest voice, he approached the woman. Nice day, he said. Have you tried the fruit from the tree in the middle of the garden? I can recommend it. It's delicious. We're not allowed to eat it, replied Eve. Why on earth not, jeered the serpent. It's lovely. God said we mustn't eat it or we'll die. Fish <laughs> laughed the serpent. You won't die. The fruit from the tree will make you powerful and clever. Just as clever as God. And he doesn't want that. <gasps> oh, well, said he. Oh, I don't know. Just try it. One little bite can't do any harm. So Eve took the fruit from the tree and bit into it. And then she rushed and told Adam and ate some too. Just then they heard God's voice calling to them. <gasps> they both went red with guilt and ran and hid. But God found them. Why are you hiding? God asked. Have you done something wrong? It was her fault, said Adam. She made me eat some of the fruit. <gasps> she made you. Is she stronger than you then? Did she force you? And God turned to Eve. Why did you disobey me? He asked. It was the snake's fault. He made me eat. Made you? Asked God. Did he force you? God turned to both of them. Sadly, no one made you eat. You both chose to disobey me. And because you disobeyed me, you cannot stay in my beautiful garden. And so, with great sadness, God led Adam and Eve out of the beautiful garden to begin their new life in the wide world. Amen. Can we borrow that for, uh, with, I'm doing the Bible study on Tuesday. <laughs> <You know. laughs> the, the second reading is from Matthew 4, reading the first 11 verses, and this is from the NIV. Jesus is tested in the wilderness. Then Jesus was led by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. After fasting 40 days and 40 nights, he was hungry. The tempter came to him and said, If you are the Son of God, tell these stones to become bread. Jesus answered, It is written, Man shall not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. Then the devil took him to the holy city and had him stand on the highest point of the temple. 
If you are the son of God, he said, throw yourself down. For it is written, he will command his angels concerning you. And they will lift you up in their hands so that you will not strike your foot against a stone. Jesus answered him, it is also written, do not put the Lord your God to the test. Again, the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their splendor. All this I will give to you, he said, if you will bow down and worship me. Jesus said to him, away from me, Satan, for it is written, worship the Lord your God and serve him only. Then the devil left him and angels came and attended him. Amen. Thank you. We're going to sing a good old hymn now. It's number 469 in your hymn book. And it's praise to the holiest in the height. A good old hymn that goes back to the old Methodist hymn book. Did you understand a word of it? 
Actually, you see, this hymn is the third reading in the lectionary. It talks about a second Adam to the fight. That's what the reading in Romans is supposed to be about. So we've actually had the three readings in our lectionary for today. The first one, the Garden of Eden. The second one, the Temptations. And this one, in totally different ways. But we've had three readings from the Bible. And in a way, what seemed to be on my mind at the present minute was was the Word, because they're all about the Word of God. And the thing is, to most people, I mean, even to us, when we sing a hymn like this, you think, what? If somebody walked in the door, and hopefully you get people walking in the door, there might be somebody today walked in the door, and if he didn't understand a word of it, don't worry. But most people out there would look at that hymn and think, I haven't a clue. What is it about? It's gibberish. And in fact, most of the actual way that we reach out to people over the past, I don't know how many years, doesn't make sense to the modern or even the older modern or even the older, older one's idea. They don't, they don't understand. If you, say, if you go like some people used to go, they used to say, have you been saved? The answer would be, from what? Because they don't, they don't need to be saved. What is there to be saved from? They've got a comfortable home. They've got a nice house. They've got somewhere to live. They've, they can get food on the table, even if it's not tomatoes. <clears throat> you know. And what's it all about? I'm going to go back to the temptations. In Matthew. And we tend to look over and over again at these to be a sort of model of how difficult it is to live and how easily it is to be tempted. And even then, you see, the idea of temptation in the modern world is a cream cake. You know, it's, it's been sort of shifted. It's not, it's not a big thing anymore. It's just, oh, I fancy another sausage. You know, it, it doesn't mean much to people. And actually... When you think about it, what happened was that Jesus has been told, now is the time to begin your mission. And he goes to John to be baptized. And he goes down under the water and he rises up and there the spirit is like a dove. And he walks, well he doesn't. It says specifically that the spirit leads him from there into the desert to be tempted. This is the beginning of his mission, and he's taken into the desert to be tempted. In fact, he's taken into the desert to be told how to be how to, 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 to do that mission. The idea of, of wrestling with God or wrestling with, with what God wants you to do is all the way through the Bible, the, the very clear times that it happens is when Jacob wrestles with God and becomes Israel or when Jesus is in Gethsemane and struggles with what God wants him to do and what it's going to be like to do it so the idea of struggle and to try to find the way forward is not unusual and here Jesus is tempted by the devil so that he can wrestle with the big question how do I do my mission And the first temptation says, see the, you know, I always love that reading where it says he was, you know, he fasted in the desert for 40 days and he was hungry. Hungry? I mean, never mind changing the rocks into bread. You'd probably try and eat them without even changing them by the time he's got that far. But, you know, do something miraculous. Show who you are. I know this is for you, but you could do it for everybody, couldn't you? You could go out into the world there, and all these people who are starving, all the people that need, you could just walk out there, and you could just say, all these stones are bread, go and eat. No problem. Everything's done. And, God, and Jesus says, God says, 
Humanity doesn't lo live by bread alone, but by every word of the Lord. Now, we have to be careful because we live in a, we live in a society where we have separated things. We live in a very materialistic society today. And that doesn't mean to say we, we like going shopping, you know, but we do. Um, what it means is that we concentrate very much on the things of the world. Now, you know, we think that science teaches us that, that what we should do is study the things of this world, the material things. Everything is material. Well, of course, if you go back to Jesus' time, it wasn't quite like that. Nowadays, we have separated in convenient slots. We have the material things, and we have the mental things, and we have the spiritual things. You know, they have the three slots. And, and, and we can conveniently sort of ignore the other ones. You know, like when we come to church, it's about the spiritual things. And when we go out into the world, it's about the material things. They didn't think like that. Neither should we, actually, but we did, didn't think like that. For them, the material things were just as spiritual as the spiritual things. And they didn't really think much of the mental things, that, although they're there. But we have to be careful, just to, just to remind you, that when it talks about the law being written on your hearts, it doesn't mean emotional, because the emotions were your gut um, in, in those days. The heart was, was the will and the, the, the mental things. But they were all mixed. So, yeah, when the, the idea that, that the bread was just something physical is not quite true. The bread was also spiritual. But here, when Jesus is beginning his mission, he is told quite specifically by God that it is not about miraculous things not about suddenly feeding everybody. And I know that this church, connected with Selby Street, understands about it not just being about bread. But some churches don't. Some churches get lost. They get lost in the idea that, you know, all we need to do is to look after people and keep them nice and happy. And that's where doing our mission. Well, of course, that's not true. It's about the word of God. And I'll come back to that. The next one, the next temptation, well, that's where he's told to sort of leap off from the temple and glide. Well, it, years and years ago, when I was young, I was young. It's getting harder to remember when I was young, but I was young once. When, as a special treat, usually when I'd been ill with chicken pox or something, I, I was allowed a Superman magazine. Now, I, only very occasionally, because they were expensive. They weren't like the Beano or the Dandy, you know, a couple of pennies. They were expensive. They were proper little magazines, a, a Superman magazine. So it only very occasionally, I was allowed a Superman magazine. Now, we've all got this sort of image of Superman, haven't we, somehow? You know, we all like this idea of the hero stepping in and flying in and sorting everything out and disappear. It goes back to even, this shows how old I really am, the Lone Ranger. <laughs> I spotted who was laughing. You know, the, the masked man who appears, sorts everything out and then disappears into the distance again. And in a way, it's sort of, it seems to be embedded into humanity, that idea, of the wonderful idea that if anything ever starts to get really bad, some wonderful being will appear out of nowhere, sort everything out, and then disappear so we can have everything to ourselves, only perfect again. Don't work. But that idea of Superman is behind that temptation. Jesus, after all, he could do anything. So he could stand on the temple and he could 
in front of the whole of the people gathered in the temple. He could, you know, gazing up into the sky, he could sweep down across their heads and land gracefully in there. They all go, wow. No, that is not how you do it, God says. Don't over-test me, he says. Don't decide that's the way I want to do it and go ahead and expect me to be Superman behind you, picking up the bits and saying everything's okay. No, that's not the way you do it. You do it the way I have asked you to do it, not the way you think you should do it, and then expect me to pick up the pieces. That's not the way it's done. So when you're going and thinking about mission, the first thing to do is find out what I want you to do, God says. Not think what I think's the way we should do it. And then leave it to God to pick up the pieces. The third one, well, that's, that's where Jesus, well, he's told, all you've got to do is bow down to me, Satan says. And then I can give you all this. I think Satan's forgotten a bit that he's got all that anyway. Um, but you think, well, that's not really relevant to us, is it? Well, actually, it can be. There's a church where, where Brenda's son, Stephen, lives in America, just down the road from where he lives. There's an enormous church, incredible big church. There's, there's some big churches in America, and we've been to some of the big churches. You know, there, there, we went to a, a Methodist church in uh, at Christmas once, and uh, it had it was about ooh, three times the size of this. Yeah, and it had at Christmas. It started at about five o'clock, and it had a, one service in the church, more formal. And then it had one service in the schoolroom, a bit more lively. And then it, all the way through till after midnight. And all of them were full. They have big churches in America. But this particular one, well, it's a bit peculiar. And unfortunately, it's not totally unique. Because instead of having a cross on the top of the church... It has a picture of the pastor. It moves. It's a big display. And it, it, go, it has all sorts of things about how wonderful he is and how wonderful the church is and how amazing it is. It's actually forgotten that it's God that we worship and not whoever's at the front of the church. And that might sound odd to you, because let's face it, we haven't got a great deal to worship at the front of the church today, have we? Um, but, but to them, it's become that. And it's the same thing. You've got to be ready in mission to understand that it's not you that you're trying to get people to like. It's Jesus you're trying to get people to come to. And it's easy to fall into the trap of saying, you know, if you follow me, you can have everything. No. If you follow God, goodness knows what's going to happen. Because you never know. And it seems to me that in those three things, there's three, when you come to actually mission, and the first one, I'll, I'll, I'll remember it in a minute, my mind's a bit fuzzy. <laughs> There is three things. I'll start at the end. Um, the first one is word. The first one is word. The second one is trust. Now, see, because God said, you know, it's not just about the bread. Every, wo every word that comes from God. The second one is trust. Trust not to pick you up after you've fallen, but trust that God will lead you in the right way. And the third one I've lost it this morning. I'll come back to it. 
word is not just about the Bible. When I was, when I had a proper job, you know, back in the days before I became minister and didn't just work on a Sunday, when, when I had a proper job, I was actually studying for, the, for my local preachers. And I used to have this on my desk at work. Well, the thing was that I was also sharing my office with a Sikh. He, he was a lovely man. Um, Tarat, he was called. And I shared my office with a Sikh. And, and, and I used to read this at my lunchtime just to, to study for me, for, for me local preachers. And the one thing he couldn't understand was why I had my Bible, my holy book, on my desk at work. Because, of course, their holy book is carefully placed on cushions on a bed in the Gurdwara because it's holy. And sometimes we forget that actually the word of God is not the Bible. The word of God is Jesus. This is important. It's vital. As you know, I'm a conservative evangelical. I go by this. But this, in the end, is only a record of the word, the word of God. What we're trying to bring people to is the word of God, which is Jesus. And we don't want to get bogged down with this. We've got to get the message, the proper message, based on this, but about Jesus to people. And if that means using readings like Brenda did to get them to, through the idea of what, what it's all about, that's fine. As long as we do it properly and get, and get them introduced to it in the right way. Trust. Before we do anything, we have to find what God wants us to do. And there's only one way to do that, and that's prayer is actually getting together, sitting, standing, lying, whatever way you want to do it, but getting together. You know, when, when God said, when two or three people gather in my name, I will be there, and you ask anything, and I'll do it for you. And you think, hmm. What is often missed out is that when it says, when two or three people get together, what it means, what the, the word in Greek that's used is symphony. It, it isn't harmony, it's symphony. So if you can imagine like a big orchestra, and every, every instrument in the orchestra is playing a different tune. But it all fits together. In symphony. And that's what God calls us to do. To be in symphony with each other. We're all different. We all do things different way. We often even talk in a different language sometimes. You know, I might talk in time side and you have a clue what I'm talking about. Um, but, but as long as we're in symphony and in symphony with God, then he will do anything you want because we'll want what he wants and then we can do it. And the last one is worship. I remembered it. I knew I would. Because God said, you know, he talked about the worship at the end of the, of, the, of the temptations. The heart of the church, any church, is it being a worshipping community. That's what we are called to be. To put God, not the pastor, not anybody else, the only person to put God in the center and worship him and him only. And without that at the heart of any church, we waste our time. I have been in many different kinds of churches. I have taken communion in very staid Anglican churches. I have been in incredibly charismatic churches where every other person is speaking in tongues and the people that aren't are interpreting it. I have, 
I've been in immensely big churches like the ones in America or in South Africa that I went to. And I have been to little, um, little chapels in the middle of nowhere with half a dozen people there, or even less. I remember taking one, one service a long time ago in Childry in, in Oxfordshire, where we had myself, a pianist, one member of the congregation, and a dog. But there was three people there, and we worshipped God. But I've also been in all those different churches where we haven't been worshipping at all. We've sung hymns. We've heard somebody speaking. We've heard somebody mumbling some prayers. But it's been quite obvious that we haven't been worshipping God. It's not about the mechanics of how you do it. It's about what you're doing in here when you worship. And it doesn't matter what hymns you sing, whether they're old or new. It doesn't matter what words you say in prayer. What matters is that you actually come and worship. Worship the one God. And when that happens, if anybody walks through that door, they won't care what the words are. They'll just know that something's special happening. And that's the sure way for them to say, I want to know more. I want to know what's going on. I want to know why, even though everything just seems to be normal, it isn't. Tell me. And that's mission. Amen.